Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back, data back conversation on all things cannabis, where we talk about cannabis MSOs, Canadian LPs, products, and market analysis through the lens of data. Today, got a couple very special guests. I am recording this uh, live from Europe, and I thought, what better time and what better people than John and Alex of Oscar to talk about Europe. So welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Si. Yeah, really excited to have you here. I know we personally talked some time ago, and I know, you know, a lot's been going along, a lot's happened uh, since then. So I thought, you know, from my perspective, and I'm sure our listeners' perspective, you know, just to to kind of get up to speed on what's going on in Europe. You know, we, we do cover a lot of MSO news and, and MSOs like Cureleaf, you know, made that big deal with EMAC uh, when they when they did that acquisition, which is a European company. And uh, I really have no sense of, of what's going on here. I know, you know, primarily medical and all of that, but I thought a good opportunity to just uh, kind of cover this topic uh, while we can. So with that, why don't we start with, you know, why don't you guys tell me a little bit about yeah, how you guys got started? So, yeah, I'll, this is John. Um, so I'm an American. I'm a neurologist. And I spent most of my career overseas, but came to Europe in 2014. And along the way, I met Alex. And the way that we got involved in looking at how cannabis and the molecules that are in the cannabis plant could be used for medical purposes is Alex has a young son who uh, began to have some abnormal movements. And there was a question about whether or not they were seizures. And Alex came to me because uh, he's a friend of mine. I'm a neurologist. And turns out his son has a quite a complicated situation. He has a genetic disorder. And there's certain you know, manifestations of this condition that include the seizures and uh, behavioral problems. And, you know, I'll let Alex tell you what he found on the Facebook page. But basically, that was how we got started. Yeah, so I can jump in real quick. Uh, thanks, John, for setting that up. But uh, basically, so I'm Canadian. I'm an engineer, worked as a venture capitalist for 11 years now, worked mostly in, you know, I was doing renewable energy when it wasn't cool clean tech and clean chemistry and a lot of my portfolio companies uh, from back in the day are doing quite well. But in 2018, uh, my so I have two kids, two sons. So James is five now and Pierre is eight. But when James was two, I, you know, he got diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called Potocki lupski syndrome, which is named after the doctors that basically discovered it or the researchers that discovered it at Baylor. And he started having these kind of seizures and I saw a lot of parents. So the only, it's one in, you know, this, this disorder has one, you know, it's one in 30,000 people get it statistically, of course, we don't know really how many people have it, but uh, they all kind of, you know, some, one of the symptoms is, is seizures and spasticity. And my son started having these kind of mini seizures at the dinner table. And, you know, when your kid's eating dinner and he kind of starts moving around, flops food everywhere, you, you kind of start looking, you know, kind of wondering what's going on. So I asked a Facebook group of parents, you know, if this happened and, and they said, yeah, it does. And a lot of parents were putting their kids on, you know, traditional seizure meds from the pharmaceutical industry. And a lot of them had actually switched off and had moved their kids to, you know, either Charlotte's Web or Epidiolex and were getting much better outcomes. So I asked John a very simple question. Should I be giving my kid CBD for his epilepsy? And then came, this basically started the long road that we are on now. And as a VC, I was seeing a lot of, you know, throughout that time, John was digging up all these articles on the endocannabinoid system. And I was traveling, I was a corporate venture guy for a company called Solvay, uh, which is a Belgian chemical major. I was running their CBC arm in Europe and seeing traveling every week and seeing a lot of companies pop out of the woodwork that were working on, you know, medical cannabis or the endocannabinoid system. And we're all complaining about the same thing, saying we we can't get any funding. So as John was, you know, sending me articles and we were chatting and he was telling me this, you know, the endocannabinoid system seems to have a lot of potential, not only for your son's epilepsy, but for a lot of other things, you know, ranging from pain, oncology, 
rare diseases, anxiety, uh, animal health, you name it. And as I was traveling throughout Europe and seeing all these companies pop out, all complaining, saying we can't get any money, I said, you know, there's, there's something to do here. So that's how it all started. And that's how Oscar came to be. Yeah. And for me, what I discovered that there had been a report from the Institute of Medicine in the U.S., you know, basically a review, 450 page document that basically had summarized all of the research up until that point that had been done with cannabis uh, for, you know, any medical condition where there had been some data generated and published. And what I came to Alex with was basically this message, which is, you know, unfortunately, people have had to do this research with very little help from the government, uh, from, uh, you know, university research uh, teams. Uh, however, what has been done looks very promising. And if you look at the fundamental importance of what we call the endocannabinoid system, there are basically receptors that are in the brain, they're in um, the gut, they're in many of the d different organs in our body, and they, this is an important regulatory system to help us maintain our health and uh, wellness. And the system gets activated when we get sick. For example, when the COVID infection comes to you, this endocannabinoid system gets activated. If you have inflammation in the eye, for example, from a virus, or you have a infection by a virus in your heart, basically the endocannabinoid system gets activated. So what we realized was that um, now because high quality research teams were getting involved in studying the endocannabinoid system and also that there were some new molecules that were being created that could interact with the system that we actually needed to begin to look at where in Europe this research work was happening and to think about putting together a portfolio of companies that we could help uh, manage. And, you know, Alex... And we have one other person who's uh, based in the UK who have spent the last 10 years kind of nurturing startups and helping them get over the speed bumps and helping them, you know, realize their dreams. And so we kind of decided that this was a project that was worthy of our effort, intellectually interesting, financially, looked like, you know, this was definitely an industry that was at an early stage. So that was basically the inspiration for us to get started. So it'd be great to kind of level set on Europe. And I know it's probably quite complicated, but what is legal and what kind of infrastructure exists or doesn't exist that, you know, all the regulatory rails might run on right now? I mean, what's the big difference between Europe and North America is that in the U.S. it's federally illegal, right? So that means that, you know, now we've just seen a recent article that says that they're going to open up research, at least grant opportunities for universities and other public research institutes. But in Europe, the difference is it's been, you know, take a step back. There's a big difference between, you know, the U.S. and Europe in terms of healthcare systems, right? In Europe, it's a bad word in the U.S., but socialized medicine, right? Which means that the state basically, you know, will reimburse a drug if it's been approved by you know, different regulatory bodies for a specific condition, for a specific price, and it needs to have a favorable outcome, right? Uh, which is a pretty tough market, but once you've opened up the market, that means that basically you can go to your pharmacy, show your card if you have a certain ailment, you can get your meds and it's free, right? Meanwhile, in the U.S., it's a bit different. In Canada, it's essentially the same thing in Europe. But what people are focusing on here is regulated products. What's happening in the U.S. is a bit cowboys and Indians with regards to, you know, state by state, you know, rec versus med. Over here, it's really regulated products that need to treat something to get it across the line. So that's what we're focusing on is over here. And we've seen, you know, with GW and, and EMAC, some big M&A deals uh, that have come through because this is a pretty big market, you know, with over 800 million people. And the states are willing to reimburse, but only if you've been through a regulatory, you know, some kind of pathway. So that's the big difference is, you know, with U.S. legalization coming, once the FDA gets their nose into it, 
officially, they're going to move towards a more European model, uh, which is what we're betting on, which is kind of the second or third wave of, of cannabis, which will be therapeutics focused on the endocannabinoid system as well as building out the ecosystem over here, which is very tech focused and very regulated, which is much different than North America. So I think you're looking more at, you know, pharma and, you know, GMP regulated tech or ISO regulated tech that can move from Europe to North America. That's what we're focusing on. And we've seen a lot of great deals, you know, they can make, a, you know, you've got 10 to one valuations and in, in terms of the metrics, you know, we're seeing very low valuations here because people are very conservative in Europe versus North America. Yeah, what I might add is I think the conversation that the governments, the politicians are more comfortable with is starting with a discussion about how to make cannabis available for a medical problem. So I think the kind of situation that is um, evolving in the U.S. where the recreational offer is um, driving a lot of commercial activity and interest by investors, I think that we will take it, it will be a longer term evolution in the market. Obviously, there is uh, a very big black market for cannabis products uh, all over Europe. But in terms of the more official environment, it, it really is going to focus on a medical and health perspective. And as Alex said, it's going to be formalized. So the advantage we see is that because the state is uh, the payer, they're motivated actually, because as you would know, there are a lot of medical conditions uh, which are being uh, treated with very expensive products. And some of these products have uh, not the greatest profile in terms of side effects. And uh, we have, you know, obviously uh, some particular situations where there really is not a good solution. And uh, what public, you know, has learned uh, by experimenting with cannabis is that there are some very good solutions that are available. So I think everyone wants to, you know, bring cannabis to patients who need it. And that will be the, the primary driver at the beginning. When we talk about Europe, are we talking about the EU? Is it is it the same in every EU country, or are some countries a little more progressive with cannabis than others? Oh, so yes, so it's a it, so the region obviously is the you know the continent <laughs> includes some non-member states of the European Union, so it's a little bit larger. Uh, but at this point, uh, it is a, a country by country process. But we are seeing collaboration, cooperation in terms of certain policies uh, that are being enacted. There are laws that are being reviewed uh, that would apply pan-Europe. And obviously, these this type of legislation does influence what happens in terms of uh, the transformation uh, within each market. But maybe Alex can tell you about you know the, some of the leading countries right now. Well, obviously, Germany has been a bit of a deception, right? Uh, people were pegging it to be, you know, two billion this year. I think they're going to make 400 million. There's kind of a, you know, they're treating cannabis as kind of a last kind of shot before they give up uh, for certain things like, you know, pain and sleep and all the rest. There's a lot of work to be done with regulators over here to get the flower across the line. I think the flower is very complicated which is why we're focusing on, you know, more regulated products, right? We've seen a lot of research being done that is now coming into fruition. So phase one or novel food is, is these guys have actually looked at what is the science behind it, right? It's not just throwing flour at something and hoping something works. In, in Europe, it's much different. You can't go to a dispensary here and say, my toe hurts, and then walk out with a bag of pot, right? It's, it's much more regulated. So... What we're seeing here, you know, in places like Germany is, uh, which is the leading market, you've got the UK as well, you've got Switzerland, they're all pushing towards, you know, getting, getting flour out to the patient. But the regulator wants, the key is to get reimbursed, is to get a C mark. And that is a bit more tricky. It takes more time. 
takes a bit more research. You have to find the indication that you're going for. So in the end, in Germany, for example, um, you're seeing flour getting reimbursed for all kinds of things, but it's seen as a last recourse, so you're not getting reimbursed. So you're blocking out a lot of patients because of that. So there's a lot of work to be done, uh, that, which is why we're focusing on the endocannabinoid system and, and you know, companies and, and techs that are actually, you know, have favorable outcomes for patients, you know, for patients and aren't going into this kind of, there's a lot of people going into this fuzzy kind of space, which is unregulated or regulated, depending on what it is. And, um, and not really talking to the regulator and getting the outcome that they want to get reimbursed. So what we're seeing really is companies moving towards novel therapeutics here, or, you know, specific wellness products that can treat, you know, things like skin issues, anxiety, and there's even a lot of work being done on animal health. So the research, I'd say the global research, we've t taken a look, you know, at, on all the patents and all the publications, everything's being done here because it's regulated. So that's where I think our edge is, is we understand regulation, we understand the endocannabinoid system, we understand what it takes to get something from the bench to the patient, which is where we think we have a specific understanding of Europe, which will be basically exportable globally because a lot of the companies we're seeing over here are doing clinical trials in Europe, but also in the US. Because they have the advantage, it's federally legal. How has the, um, the investment landscape been in Europe? I know you guys were out there and you made some big headlines uh, when you first came together. Are there a lot of groups like Oscar that are out there? I think we're like, we're pretty unique. You know, we've got good people like Anexus that are pretty good. I don't know, you know, Anexus out of Sweden. They're pretty good. We've got, you know, the guys at Crystal in, in the UK. Artem is, is trying to do something. And we know a few US funds are trying to move over, but it's not easy. You know, you got to understand the landscape. There's a few VC funds that are trying to play, but they don't have the know-how. So... I, you know, we've been scouting in Europe for years, so I've had a lot of funds actually send me deals asking me, you know, what do you think? Because I've, you know, done a bunch of deals in other spaces and, you know, that's a small community here. So I think we're pretty unique actually in, in our, you know, globally, I think, in terms of focusing on the endocannabinoid system and focusing on, you know, real tech that can make the sector evolve. I think that's our key differentiating factor and you won't find that anywhere globally. And Europe has kind of forged us into this thesis. So it's slow but steady, I think. And um, in Europe, you know, I think you'll see a lot of the, you know, mainstream VC funds start playing in the space in the next two to three years, but not now. Yeah, part of, I think, what we would say also is that the opportunities are small now and they need to be nurtured. And I think for U.S. investors to come in when there's still a lot of basic uh, work that needs to be done to kind of uh, develop a company and develop the opportunities so that they could come in and and feel confident that the enterprise is, um, you know, going to be transformable with uh, further investment. I think we're ready. We're not starting with things that are at like zero, but we may be having an appetite to work with with companies that that show a lot of promise. But they they need a couple of years of nurturing, you know, before they they kind of uh, see the the light uh, of a, of a big time investor. So. We, we feel as though the quality is here of the research work, the opportunities, and we are able to have good relations with the teams because uh, Alex uh, and our other uh, lead investor have experience working with uh, these types of companies. We're, you know, one, one of us uh, is in the UK and one here in Paris. So I think that's another factor. I can maybe give you an example of one company that we did, and we're doing a second one right now, which is quite funny. We're doing a second deal that we're warehousing for the fund uh, in Italy, which the U.S. guys came in, but they were like five weeks after we had signed the term sheet. So they're coming in late because they don't have good scouts on the ground here. But I can give you an example of Octarine Bio. I don't know if you've heard of them. Yeah, I saw the news uh, when, you, when you did the investment, but I'm not familiar with the, the organization, so I'd love to hear more. So... So this company basically, so we're snipers, we're hunt, we're scouts, like we're really, we know tech, we know what can make money, 
long term and it can make you know f- fun returners. So Octarine was a company that it's a team that out of the University of Copenhagen and Danish Technical University that had basically before focusing on novel cannabinoids and psychedelics had already made had already disrupted the uh, food and fragrance market using synth you know uh, vanillin. I don't know if you know vanillin. It's a vanilla flavor. Okay. It's in everything. It's like one of the top three food additives in the world. And they had made, they had found a way to do it synthetically using fermentation. So synthetic biotech. And, um, you know, through my network, I had met them in Copenhagen in 2019. And they said, oh, we're spinning out a business. We're thinking of doing novel cannabinoids. And this was when I was kind of thinking about, you know, launching Oscar. And when I saw what these guys were doing, they were using the same enzymatic libraries that were patented and protected by the, you know, Danish Technical University and Houston University of Copenhagen and were got an exclusive license for it to do this. I said, holy smokes, because what's missing in cannabis is, uh, at least in, you know, endocannabinoid system related research is novel molecules, which is what pharma, big pharma wants, right? Because with a novel molecule, you can get composition of matter, which means that you can protect this molecule from day one, which means that you can then go down a therapeutic route or even a CPG route and be quite, you know, be, as we say in France, tranquille, you know, you don't need to stress about it because you've got the IP backing you. And they said, we want to develop a whole new class of cannabinoids that can target the endocannabinoid system but don't come from the plant and we can produce it at, you know, 10% of the cost because they do it in a fermenter. And when I saw them and I knew the pedigree of these people, I said, holy smokes, these guys are onto something and they have the IP behind them. And so we invested in them in 2019 that we're, we're, we're warehousing it for the fund. And I, you know, when we saw it, you know, when we did the deal, we said, this has such a huge potential from an intellectual property standpoint, but also from a marketing standpoint. And, You know, today, you know, we've raised money, you know, we're the only fund in the world who has invested alongside a sovereign wealth fund. Amazing. So they even, you know, Vex Funding, which is the Danish sovereign wealth fund, uh, seeded it. And now they're raising, you know, a series A, they're raising $15 million and they're almost there. And um, so this shows that we're, you know, very good at identifying these nuggets. It's not something that'll come from a bank, you know, it's something that you need to go find. You know, you need to find them. You need to hear about it. And it's a lot of word of mouth in Europe. It's not, you know, some banker from, um, you know, JP Morgan that's going to send you a deal. It'll be, you know, a researcher or another CEO of another company that, you know, which will tell you, you know, this company is doing this. And we have another one that we're working on right now, which is a bit kind of in submarine mode, which is very similar using catalytic chemistry that can basically make rare cannabinoids for very cheap. Amazing. So. It's the sovereign fund that that came in did, when they came in originally was the company set up as a to produce these cannabinoids or they no no challenges around that I mean just given the 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 framework the legal framework in the EU they were they were ready no. to go no there is synthetic biotech making products that are going into a regulated pathway amazing easy peasy well right. it wasn't easy peasy but. Uh, <laughs> But uh, no, they're no, they're they're good people. That's super interesting, and and so these are the kinds of investments that we can expect to see out of uh, Oscar over time. Well, the next one that you're gonna see is one coming out of Italy, which is uh, like I'm a chemical engineer. So when I when I saw this company, I had a pardon pardon my expression, but I had a huge boner when I saw them because they have a platform. Like w- the other thing that we look for is platform technologies. And we don't get excited only about the tech. We get excited about the potential, the market, as well as the management. Uh, we're not just tech fiends, but we, we also look at how to make it grow. But this company is doing uh, enzymatic extraction that can basically reduce the cost, the danger, um, and can basically you know, spread out across a bunch of industries. They're using you know, enzymatic technology that I know very well uh, to degrade biomass. So you don't need to dry your cannabis, you can run it through, you can get either a aqueous form or a lipid form, so oil or water, 
cannabinoids in oil or water. There's a few weaknesses to the process, which is in terms of terpene recovery, but that's being dealt with. But this company is a nugget that they came to find us because they knew that we, you know, they had people that were connected from the traditional tech space that were connected to me and they got in touch with, with myself and somebody else. And now we're doing a deal, you know, two and a half million raise going to be announced in, you know, early September, uh, mid September, sorry, you know, we're, we're setting up a partnership with a CRO as well. So, you know, I guess you can see us more as kind of a blue chip fund that is tackling the sector in a much different way, focusing on life sciences, as well as building out the ecosystem using proven technologies that can maybe be adapted to cannabis or novel technologies that are made for cannabis, but can be adapted to other sectors. So that's how you need to see us. Got it. And and so, Alex, with your background in, in tech and chemical engineering, you know, the fund and, and spotting companies like this all make sense. And John, with your background, are, are you helping these investments? You know, oftentimes, you know, when venture comes to invest, it's, you know, there's the capital and then there's the support that the investment brings. Are you able to kind of take some of your expertise and, and bring that to these organizations? Yeah. So right now I'm involved in the due diligence as we look at the opportunities. I'm a physician. I've you know been involved also in research and we have alongside myself, we have a researcher here in Paris who works at the equivalent of the NIH. And he's one of the world's top researchers in the cannabis receptors in the brain. And so he works alongside with us when we meet a team and they uh, talk about their research findings and they, we have a chance to look at their intellectual property. It's very important that, you know, we have a, a chance to look over things and it's part of our evaluation process, whether or not, uh, you know, this is uh, an opportunity that's worthy of our attention or we pass on. We also have on our team retired former CEO of Sanofi. Uh, so again, someone with a 30 plus year career in big pharma, who's also a physician. So the medical side plays a role uh, right now in, in, in vetting opportunities and also understanding uh, you know, where we need to be looking. And as you said, there'll be a role for us once we launch our fund and we have our portfolio companies to be involved in, in helping alongside Alex and Nicola, who uh, is based in London, you know, in terms of uh, giving guidance to the teams. So I can just add on to what John's saying, because it's important what you're saying is what we've combined here is, you know, we've got some, you know, we've got Bruce Linton, who's a, you know, he talked about Gage at the beginning of his show. He's our chairman. We've got Olivier Bronzico, who's the former CEO of Sanofi. We've brought together a really strong team who can basically weed out a lot of the people that say, oh, we have this treatment, we have this, that treatment using cannabinoids or using something else that can target the system and basically promise the moon. We have the people that can actually go down into the intellectual, really go down into the weeds, look at the IP, the potential in terms of the therapeutic, look at the science and look at the deal structuring. You know, we have that all built into the team. So that's what makes us a bit special. So we see a lot of deals come through and we basically kind of rip them, you know, uh, rip them up relatively quickly or, you know, say this has some legs and we go for it. So we're, we're a bit like snipers, you know. We've brought together a really strong team to focus on the, you know, the life science side of things, but also on the ecosystem building side of things, at least over here in Europe. And we see a lot of deals that promise a lot of things. And then when we go into the detail, it's actually just hogwash. So we're able to filter out the noise pretty quickly. Yeah, and imagine with, you know, biotech like investments, I mean, that's a huge piece of it, right, is just being able to to filter through claims and understand the, the science behind those claims and if it's if it's real or not. And uh, sounds like you guys are, are pretty well set up for that. Well, we have like basically four deals to to execute at first close that have been identified specifically. One of them has been has unfortunately done quite well. We're hoping to get it in earlier, but they've done quite well, but there's still a massive upside, but there's still a few kind of sleepers that we have that we think could, could really have a huge amount of potential from a therapeutic or industrial standpoint, but also especially from an investment standpoint. So 
we know how to find the nuggets. Yeah, that's that's half the battle. So one of the things, you know, we cover a lot on these shows, you know, MSOs in the U.S. and then the Canadian LPs. And I wanted to ask you guys, since, since I have you here, you know, thoughts on, on some activity that's happened. You know, we saw Cure Leaf and the EMAC deal, you know, and we heard uh, just recently Tilray's CEO, Erwin Simon, mentioned, you know, their $4 billion revenue plan. And one of the four pillars uh, of this revenue plan was Europe. And they, he, he stated it's a $1 billion opportunity for them alone. How do you, how do you, do you see more of this happening? Like what, are, what are your thoughts on this kind of activity and these kind of headlines? That's a good question. John? Yeah, so I, th- you know, their, their business is providing product uh, to be dispensed. I think uh, it's going to be, again, uh, their sales are going to be dependent on the legislative changes. Uh, as we've seen in the UK, there is still a difficulty in terms of accelerating the size of the market when you don't have a a medical community that has been trained uh, formally in the way that uh, we're trained to evaluate medical conditions, understanding the role that, you know, specific pharmaceutical products can be used. So in order to realize that investment, they're going to need to really support an infrastructure, which is the kind of thing that we're working on in our fund, which is, you know, if you want cannabis and products in this category to be successful and you have physicians that are involved in prescribing them to patients, then there needs to be a a support system to get them uh, up to speed so they can confidently recommend the products. And what we've seen in the UK up until now is that uh, this has been a big, I would say, inhibitor of progress uh, in terms of having patients easily gain access to treatment. So I think that it is going to be similar in other markets. So we don't have the situation as uh, is happening in the U.S. where you have a dispensary which is staffed by people who are not formally, you know, employed as medical people. I mean, they don't necessarily, they probably are quite knowledgeable about uh, what they're selling, but they cannot have the kind of relationship that uh, a patient has with a healthcare professional, you know, and that's, as Alex was saying, that's, that's going to be the predominant system here in Europe. So we're uh, very excited about uh, that, that number, because it means that they're probably going to be helping support the creation of the infrastructure. But a lot of people are betting on Europe without really knowing Europe, right? That's the other thing that's interesting is that over over here, you know, there's a very strong pharma community. You know, Europe, European pharma is very strong. I think, you know, in terms of research, I think Europe is potentially leading the way from an EU 26 or 27 perspective. But what they're missing and what I think big pharma, we've looked at kind of the weak market signals is big pharma is betting starting to bet on the endocannabinoid system again right they're looking at novel so we're looking at synthetics but also phytocannabinoids so plant-based molecules and i think that's where you know we look at companies you know you know msos or canadian cannabis producers they don't really have a pipeline you know they don't really have a pipeline they don't really have anything that's you know really patent protected in terms of you know, can this drug go to market? They, I don't know if they necessarily have the people internally that can get a drug to market or get a treatment out to market. But for us, you know, we don't touch growers. You know, the plant is a commodity. So we try to look at everything that's after that. And I think that's where Europe will go is they'll develop specific therapeutics, either plant-based, synthetic-based, or a combination of both. And they'll be the first ones out to actually reimburse and start treating patients because everybody now in North America is very focused on the recreational market, right? Meanwhile, over here, it's focused more on research and it's a slow burn. But, you know, when you look at GW, they're European based and they're the biggest exit. So we've seen a lot of teams here that are doing some really cool stuff, but it'll take a bit of time. So you need to be a bit patient, but you need to understand how it works over here, which I think a lot of the North American players don't. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel that as well. I mean, I when you look from the outside in, it you see these headlines, and, and I think what, what you guys are saying, I mean, it's very different business models from the kind of companies that you guys are looking at and um, the kind of companies that they are, you know, their adult use, and obviously they have a medical footprint as well. Uh, you know, Tilray started as medical, you know, Cureleaf's in a lot of medical markets, but Cureleaf also talks about being a CPG brand, a consumer brand, you know, and I feel like it's a very different muscle from the more regulated kind of pharma world that, that we might see emerge in Europe and not to say that Europe won't get there or there might, you know, there won't ever be a adult use market there, but it just, it still feels a ways off, you know, to me. I think it'll happen sooner than we think. But it's tough to pick the timing, you know. It's yep. tough to pick the time, you know, when it's going to happen, you know. Yeah, Europe, I think you, you could, know, you say that for the U.S. too. Yeah, but I mean, you've seen like it's it's kind of crazy. But uh, in Canada, I'll com- Canada is always leading the way in terms of um, specific, uh, in terms of a G7 or kind of Western country perspective. They legalized gay marriage a long time ago, and, and it took Europe like 15 years to get there, right? I think for cannabis, it'll be a lot quicker because they're dealing with a much bigger problem, at least over here in France. Like France is a terrible country for, for cannabis, by the way. We pretty much picked the wrong, the worst country in Europe to, to start this thing. But thank God we had Ireland. We have great partners in Ireland who are, you know, we've domiciled the fun there. But in France, I mean, they've got the most smokers. And they have the harshest penalties criminally. So it's a real dichotomy. But I think, you know, all it takes is one politician to change things and it can move fairly quickly. So they're, they're, I think Europeans are looking at North America very closely as to how uh, the recreational market is going. And the legal, you know, the you know, medical market's a completely different beast. But I think, you know, in the next five to ten years, you can expect a few big European countries to legalize. I think it's getting there. That- cool to see you walk yeah. around Paris and you smell cannabis everywhere. So somebody's making money off of it. It's not the government. So. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, a lot like the U.S., uh, the way it goes. And so, yeah, for sure, eventually it'll happen. But uh, we'll, we'll be sure to, to, to try and track that. And it's all, it's all timing and it's anybody's guess, I know. And some people are going to get really lucky and the time it just right. And other people, you know, might be too early, too late. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think it's a great point to wrap it up here. Um, where can uh, everyone find out more about Oscar? You can just go to oscarcapital.com. So O-S-K-A-R-E capital.com. Or you can just email John or myself. So Alex or John at uh, Oscar, O-S-K-A-R-E capital.com. Feel free to send us an email or go on the website. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining today, guys. It was so uh, helpful for me to to just get some more background on everything going on in Europe here, and uh, really excited to to track it and and you know see the headlines. And I'll watch out for that Italian investment uh, that that you guys are making, and um, we'll have to have you back on the the show again soon. Thanks a lot, Sai, and uh, enjoy uh, Normandy. Will do. Will do. And uh, hopefully, I'll catch you in Paris next time. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.